Hello, everyone. GM, GM. Welcome back to another episode of Overpriced JPEGs. Instead of our usual weekly recap episode here this Friday, I have an extra special episode for y'all. We are joined by a whole cohort of incredible thought leaders in the space of NFTs and Web3 to talk about and debate, and as I've been joking, really battle about CC0, which is arguably the most in vogue conversation happening in the NFT space right now. To help me in this conversation, I have Derek Edwards to my left, partner at Collab Currency. Did I get that right, Derek? And yeah, advisor right. to Proof, can I say that? Advisor to Proof. Fantastic. Zeneca33, if you listen to this show, you absolutely know Zeneca. He is on every other week with me. Thought leader, writer, collector, et cetera. Founder of Zen Academy. DC investor, the man with the best NFT collection around. Uh, frequent contributor to Bankless as well. John Rogers, you know him from my podcast. Former head of franchise development at Disney. So we'll have some interesting perspectives there on the IP front. And then of course, Jimmy.eth, founder of Nameless NFT42. You know him on Twitter. Maybe the man with the strongest opinions on this topic, but I don't know, we'll find out. DC Zeneca might give you a run for your money, we'll see. Um, okay, I said this to y'all beforehand, but I think I wanted each of you on here because I think you all have, you have some daylight between you in terms of your beliefs on this, but I also think y'all have really reasonable opinions. I'm gonna go out and say it, I think like super strong maxis in either direction, like everything should be CC0 or absolutely nothing should ever be CC0. I don't think there's really reasonable arguments to be made on those extremes. Everyone here falls somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. So I think this conversation is gonna be about really giving people guidance and giving your perspectives on when CCZ is the best option, when non-CCZ is a better option, how people should be thinking about this if they're running their own projects, thinking about launching a project, but also let's have some like fun debate here and figure out really where the daylight between you guys lives and, uh, and hash out those differences. Immutable X is the layer two platform for crypto gaming. Immutable offers massive scalability with up to 9,000 transactions per second and instant transaction confirmation. No more gas fees, no more waiting around for your transaction to clear. Immutable's zero knowledge roll up finally unlocks the world of crypto gaming. Immutable X is the only gas free NFT minting platform with over 26 million NFTs minted, all with zero gas fees. With the power of Immutable, gaming developers don't also need to become smart contract developers, they just need to plug in to Immutable's API and instant instantly start unlocking the full potential of crypto assets inside of games. This is why world-class companies and projects have decided to deploy on Immutable X like GameStop, Ember Sword, Planet Quest, Illuvium, TikTok, and many more behind the scenes. So start building your game on Immutable X today at immutable.com. CoinShift is a leading treasury management and infrastructure platform for DAOs and crypto businesses who need to manage their treasury operations. Every crypto org needs to manage their treasury, and CoinShift offers a simple, flexible, and efficient multi-chain treasury management platform built on top of the extremely secure Gnosis Safe. With CoinShift, your organization can go from primitive single-chain treasuries to expressive, flexible, multi-chain features such as global user management, global contracts, proposal management, and many other features that can be shared across an entire organization. CoinShift layers on powerful treasury management tools on top of the proven security of Gnosis Safe, allowing users to save time and reduce operational burdens and gas costs. CoinShift even has data tools like account reporting across the seven chains on which it operates. Used by industry powerhouses such as Uniswap Grants, Balancer, Consensus, and Mazari, CoinShift is speeding up the coordination and efficiency of the organizations that use it. In DeFi, you have to keep up with the frontier, and CoinShift makes that easy. So sign up at coinshift.xyz slash bankless. I wanted to start just to level set and see if I could get each of you to, as succinctly as possible, frame up how you would describe your position on CC0. Derek, again, you're, you're to my left here, I see you first. Why don't you kick us off? Cool, yeah, yeah. so I'll just uh, kick it off. And Carly, I think you did a great job of kind of um, explaining the, the, the middle ground here. And I think I, I probably come in somewhere, somewhere around there. Um, CCO, tightly controlled IP, every variation of licensing that will exist in between those two spectrums. It's my view that these are just tools in the toolkit for all types of artists and creators that are interacting with this technology. And my view is that as long as there's some marginal value that a creator can derive out of leveraging one of those tools in the toolkit, it should deserve to exist, right? Like this technology really should be agnostic in how creators approach it. Um, and my view is that there's gonna be some value that comes out of tightly controlled IP, very loosely controlled IP, complete CCO over the coming decades. Um, with that said, I do have a pretty strong conviction that over the coming decades, 
we're going to see absolutely monster, monster, massive outcomes for projects that are purely CCO. And those could be objects that are purely artistic. They could be objects that are PFPs. Um, but I do feel very strongly that some of the biggest outcomes that, that come out of leveraging uh, this creative, this technology in very creative ways, many of them, many of those outcomes are going to be powered by, uh, by CCO. Zanaka, Roy, you're next on my screen. Kick us off yeah. next. I kind of want to role play and be like very vehemently against uh, CC0 just for fun. And <laughs> because the reality is like, I'm just sitting here nodding my head and like, I basically agree and echo everything Derek just said. Uh, you know, play devil's advocate. Different... Yeah, uh, well, uh, that's harder because it's not my position. Uh, I I'll say that uh, I think I think it's too early to, t like it it it's so s early in this experiment of CC0 IP for like, creative intellectual property we, we've seen it play out for decades centuries w with you know disney and mickey mouse and, and all sorts of other ip and we've seen how that works i don't think we've at least not to my knowledge really seen how it works where a community is formed or or, or the this ip is out there and it, it's in the public domain like from really early on bef without having a big brand sort of steer it and create a direction uh i would say yeah, so it's all an experiment. I'm I'm generally pro CC zero as a concept, and but I think again it has a time and a place, and we don't know what is going to be best and what's not. Uh, sort of a concept that I think is really interesting is some idea where the IP is owned by a centralized entity, and they steer the narrative for a while, and then maybe five, ten years in the future, maybe not a hundred years in the future, but five, ten, three years make a decision, a community vote to say, hey, all right, so we've built a brand around this now, there's awareness, we've steered the ship, now do we want to go CC0? I think that's an interesting thought to have, but yeah, generally pro CC0, I guess. John, you're next on my screen. All right, well, Derek kind of said what I was going to say, but the licensing is a tool to a means to an end, that um, you know, it's up to the creator to decide where they want their project to go and how it should go. And they should choose the right license that will facilitate that outcome. Um, I think it's important for creators to be clear what their goals are up front, um, at least in terms of communicating their, with their community. And if they don't know where it's going to go, making a choice that allows for greater flexibility. That said, in the near term, and I'll say near term is the next, say, three to five years, I'm a bigger fan of restricted licensing. If your goal is to build a content brand, if you want to run a grand experiment and see where a community can take a content brand and see what the outcome can be looking at it long-term, then I love CC0. I love where nouns are going, for instance. I'll use nouns today a couple of times because I've been getting deeper in their ecosystem recently. Um, but that's like that's an experiment. That's going to be a long-term play. And the reality is for me and where I am in the space, I'm looking to build content brands in the near term. I'm looking to build a business in the, in the short term. And so I need to focus the majority of my attention on the restricted side of, of the equation, but I'm going to have a foot in the, in the CC0 side as well. Is nouns the exception to you, or do you think, are there other CC0 projects right now that you think really make sense of CC0? I, I think there are a lot of projects that make sense of CC0. The reason I, I'm, I'm spending most of my time in nouns is just because I have limited attention. I have limited availability, and I just have to pick a place to play. And I've chosen to pick the nouns as the, the playground I want to experiment in. Jimmy, you're next on my screen. Hit us. Cool. I like the way John framed it up um, in general, but I'm going to uh, take a little bit longer and tell the story of how I got to where I am as to why I believe that IP rights are important and, and uh, I believe they're a powerful uh, tool for narrative, just as the folks here believe CCO is. Um, I started as a collector of CryptoKitties and we were creating these CryptoKitties and making new CryptoKitties out of a genetic and we had some intent in what we were trying to create. It would create some undesired results, but it would create different results. And when they first came out, um, we had no rights other than um, as an artist would give rights to uh, their buyers. Uh, those were the rights we had for a crypto kitty. We could display it. We could sell it, um, which was a new kind of thing with the on, on chain stuff uh, with the NFTs in general. But we didn't have the right to like use them um, for uh, our own commercial means, really. 
And then we as a community kind of started to advocate for that. I was one of the early advocates in you know February, March of 2018, trying to say, hey, we should have some ability to use these things and have commercial rights to them. So they came out with the NFT license eventually a year later, um, Dapper Labs did for CryptoKitties. And then I thought that that was an interesting thing, but they restricted commercial use and you couldn't use it for your brand or anything else. You could basically make mugs and t-shirts, which was a nice step. Um, and some projects still elect to use that today. It's somewhere on the spectrum. Um, and uh, so when I eventually wanted to do my own project, Avastars, um, I modified that license basically and gave full commercial rights exclusivity um, to the holders to use their Avastars in any way they wanted. Um, so for me, this journey has been, you know, from starting out and seeing no rights at all to getting the commercial rights and seeing the power of being able to apply um, existing laws and existing mechanisms of value creation. There's immense value in IP. Um, and I'm sure John could probably demonstrate, you know, illustrate that with his experiences in the industry. Um, being able to have a way to convey that to people. I believe is powerful and that aligns the incentive of the holder directly to the building of the brand and value creation in a way that CCO doesn't necessarily. So I also am a fan and what I want, the reason I brought up Avastars isn't because we did the one of an early commercial license necessarily, but it's interesting because when I was designing it, I had to debate with um, the de developer that I was designing with to get things into the project, even though it was my project, um, it was a very uh, democratic process. And one of the debates I didn't win was I actually wanted to make the traits themselves a public good. I was CCO wasn't a familiar term to me at the time, but I wanted to make the trait themselves a public good available for anybody to use in any way they wanted um, for free um, with a license for, I guess it would be a CCO license to be quite honest with you. Um, but uh, the original collection would be the first collection and the official collection to utilize those traits, um, thus pro you know, providing the initial providence and the uniqueness of that collection itself. So I, was, I didn't win that debate, unfortunately, and the traits are actually locked behind uh, admin uh, access, and we've looked at ways and explored ways to open that up, but it's not an easy thing, unfortunately. Um, so I just want to say that like, I do see applications for this in the space very much so. Um, and I am excited about like native projects like nouns, um, but I also have limited time and um, funds to, you know, invest in a thesis really. And my thesis is based around IP rights. And that's why I'm advocating strongly in the favor of those things and trying to find examples of that to uh, highlight and illustrate for other people to be inspired. Because at the end of the day, I feel like I don't mean to pit it this way, but perhaps I'm framing it up this way a little bit. I feel like CCO is communism and IP rights is capitalism. And, you know, capitalists need... This is the heat you know, we need in this examples. debate. Capitalists need examples of things to aspire to be and to go after. And if I hold this NFT, then I can potentially create enough value in this and become a millionaire or successful person. Um, with the CCO thing, it's like everybody's going to work towards the same objective and goals and try to make this thing better. So that's where I'll kind of cap things off for myself and probably lead in perfectly to uh, Mr. DC Investor himself here. I just want to add one thing. I just suddenly became a socialist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, I don't consider I don't consider myself a socialist, but I'll, I'll share I'll share my thoughts on this, and uh, I'll start with the premise of look, I do like public goods and I like public domain stuff in general. And as someone who grew up with seeing like the rise of the consumer internet, it's been really interesting for me to see like the rise of, and the power of open source software um, going, becoming this thing that is powering a lot of the internet in so many ways. And, and it's become a tool that has really accelerated um, software development because anyone can see the code, anyone can extend it. I just think that's been a really powerful driver over the past 30 years. Um, I also think when we talk about public, well, when we talk about CC0, we're really talking about um, public domain. So I'll use the terms interchangeably for this discussion, but public domain is obviously not a new concept. But I think when you pair it with NFTs, it potentially gets really interesting um, because NFTs, um, 
possibly, I'm going to say po possibly because we're not really sure yet, but they possibly allow for value accrual through asset provenance. So now, before in the past, the way that you would make money off of an intellectual property is you create things that you are selling based on that, um, you are licensing out that intellectual property to others. Um, and so obviously with public domain assets, you don't have that licensing aspect. Do I think CC0 public domain is right for everything? Definitely not. I think though, it is an important tool in creators toolkits. And I think now that people have that tool, it's going to get really interesting. Um, I think there's a lot of new paradigms that are going to be explored that we haven't really had the opportunity to explore now that we can do this alongside NFTs. And I, you know, to take my thoughts a little bit further, I like on-chain assets, okay? I like public blockchains. I like on-chain laws um, in general. Just as a premise, I don't love the idea of marrying that with like off chain baggage and legal rights, which might vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction when this is really a global movement. However, I do think that there is a place for that. I think there's a place for experimentation. I'm very open to seeing how this melding and experimentation works because this is not going to be the last time we see off chain legal rights being paired alongside on chain assets. And so I am interested to see what happens. I'm interested, especially to see some of these hybrid models. I think my concern is that when we see centralized owners of intellectual capital who are basically making promises to their holders, hey, you've got this right, wink and nod, but at the end of the day, they're actually controlling the intellectual property or they're, they're not really giving up their rights. They're just licensing someone else to use it and they can revoke it at any time. That is my concern. And I don't think these things have been tested in courts yet. Um, and they, I, they will be tested, right? I mean, there will come a point when one of these IP rights issuers, you know, let's say Yuga Labs license to, gives all their ape holders rights to use their their um, assets um, and they might not like what somebody does at some point with it and then there's going to be a lawsuit and then we're going to test these things and i think that is healthy for the ecosystem because we need to see how those things play out but i think my final point on cc zero public domain as an opening for this discussion is i think it has the potential to create this really interesting library of contemporary public domain content and it's going to contribute to this idea of composable culture and there's already tons of stuff that's public domain. Most of it is like hundreds of years old. Um, but I think having like contemporary stuff from like contemporary famous artists contributing to public domain has the potential to serve as a big culture accelerant. And I think finally, um, you know, I think it's important to remember that in the long run, uh, everything becomes CC zero public domain anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> whether we want it to or not. I want to ask on the on-chain law piece, it sounds like you think the solve here is inevitably going to be a blending of like on-chain with off-chain legal rights. Does this get solved or is one solution to this just having our rights better ascribed and better outlined and putting those legal documents on-chain and having more of this get litigated by a smart contract, for example? I mean, I don't think it's the solution. I think it's a solution that's going to happen. I don't actually think it'll be the most efficient or effective one. And I think a lot of people are going to avoid those models because they don't want to deal with courts because jurisdictions are so different. So whether it, I think those, if those things are put on chain, it definitely provides probably additional legal backing around certain claims. But it, like I said, a lot of this stuff has just not been tested in courts. Like we haven't tested, as far as I know, we haven't tested like an on-chain declaration of rights that a user has in a court to see if that holds up. So, but but I do think we're going to see every, we're going to see CC0 public domain, centralized controlled IP and everything in between in the next 10 years. And I think it's going to be a really interesting time for the industry. All of you can mentioned, I, yes. Can I add a couple of thoughts to that, Carly? Because I think it's really interesting. I totally agree. Just like, uh, there's two things I take away from DC's response that I, I tend to agree with. The first is when you start reintroducing jurisdiction-based law for a global technology, things get really messy. Like we have the ability to send value at the speed of the internet 24 seven, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, anywhere around the world, any time of day. Um, and then we also have, you know, hundreds of countries laws that apply in very jurisdictional bounds and trying to take that global technology where all of this economic activity is getting created and trying to uh, let's call it like shoehorn that technology into like each jurisdiction wholesale becomes a very difficult proposition. So I, I definitely think we're handicapping like our ability. I, I think we're numbing this tech, the real power of this technology when we start to do that. And I'd love to hear from John and Jim on this. The second thing 
is actually slightly different, which is not the difficulty of introducing the, reintroducing the legal layer to this technology, which I think is a big unsolved problem. The second is that I just think um, we're handicapping the technology net net when we have the ability to prove that individuals now own these digital objects and we have that perfect provenance. And instead of leaning into that design space to bring value back to the object owner, we're reintroducing these legal rights that don't really play well with this technology. Instead of designing products and like increasing the surface area by which value can connote to the fact that um, Cosimo owns the right click and save piece or that DC owns this specific ringer or that Roy owns this specific asset on the blockchain. Um, I think what will end up happening from an innovation perspective is that the winning technology projects are going to lean into the fact that we now can prove provenance and ownership of these objects and start to simulate some of what the legal layer has done historically over the last hundred years in terms of like establishing provenance of partnerships or in establishing partnership over, you know, these rights that you can codify into smart contracts. And I think that's where like the most interesting design space for innovation is going to exist instead of trying to map this trust minimized technology to something that's very wildly inefficient. So the internet, you described the internet by the way, um, earlier when you were talking about the issues to like, you know, this world changing technology that has to have all these different rules and laws and regional silos and things. And that's the internet. Um, so that is like part of what's going on here too, even in the NFT space is that where you operate the just jurisdiction in which you operate, you're beholden to those laws and rules. And you can see with OpenSea having to do things that web three purists, maxis do not want to see happen. Things getting, getting delisted, marked as stolen, DCMA takedowns, um, all those rules apply. If you want to do an NFT drop and you live in the United States or your jurisdiction is the United States, then there's specific countries that you have to restrict from being able to mint um, if you want to be able to turn that Ethereum into cash, you have to be able to KYC all of that Ethereum. And in many cases, NFT projects actually can't convert that Ethereum into cash at all. Um, and there's multiple steps in order to do that. We live in a world of laws that exist and will continue to exist. And we'll need to op operate with this nuance in a international landscape. However, I totally agree that there is probably are there are probably ways to simplify a lot of these things and to make it a lot easier for different jurisdictions to adopt and say this is valid. Um, you know, you, you know, smart contracts are valid in the legal sense and can enforce these things properly. Um, but I also think that it's a really powerful mechanism that we can use to strengthen our rights around IP and everything else. And by virtue of going CC zero an entity is giving up their uh, intellectual property rights to something that they you would hope was building value in behind it. And it's a big bet for that entity, let's say, for example, like nouns has their own individuals getting, you know, these nouns and there is some like value incentive for them to continue to build there. But that's, that's the only incentive they have. Like where's Moonbird's incentive now, right? For example, um, in continuing to do that and by the way dc you brought up the idea that maybe we'll see like something happen where like some sort of trigger an event like occurs where people challenge some things i mean moonwards just went from giving ip rights to taking them away completely um and didn't involve the community in any sort of web3 way it was a very draconian web2 we're going to do what we want and we know what's best move rather than involving the community um, and the community doesn't seem to be against the idea of CC zero as much as the move that and how that was done there. Um, but anyways, I think that really we live in a place where there are laws in different places and no matter what we want to be the case, you know, I, I am an adoption maxi. I'm not even an NFT maxi. I'm not an ETH maxi. I'm an adoption maxi. And I believe this is a new layer of the internet that we're just tacking on top that improves everything that we're doing worldwide in a lot of different ways from, you know, currency to NFTs, to property rights, to, leases to identity and everything else i want to see it all happen and i as you guys know i'm sure along with you know everybody else here i love on chain the idea of on chain and the way that that's providence and it, and it can confer rights and things like that so that's why i'm here for for this side of the nft thing i think we all want the same end here at the end of the day but i i, I don't think that the solution is to ignore these rules and regulations i think the idea is to like find a way to make them favorable like I think the bottom line is, is the only reason we can use Uniswap today is because we're allowed to. It's been decided that we can. 
not because it's decentralized all the way and everything else. We just saw Tornado Tash get sanctioned. There's a big LOL moment by a lot of the Web3 folks, but it's a really real thing. And there's implications now to using that service potentially. Um, it opens up a lot of things that can scare the shit out of people. That's not going to get adoption in play here. So like trying to go all the way Web3 and just saying, fuck you laws, I don't think is going to get us to where I want us to go. And I don't think we all want to go. But I don't. I also think that's a kind of a different argument than CCO and uh, and IP rights. Like I think both can be along the journey of getting us there in a great way. Um, just like from talking about like a adoption or a, a maximization of the of a, applications of Web three here, I think it's still going to be a middle road here. I want to riff on that for a second. Sorry, let me in, Coach. <laughs> um, so I want to take it out of the legal context for a second and talk about the distribution context. And so we still are dealing in the current world today with centralized entities for distribution. If you create a physical product based on a uh, on an IP, you have to deal with Target, you have to deal with Walmart, you have to deal with Amazon. If you want to create music based on an IP, you have to deal with Universal or Sony. You're still dealing, and they're very centralized. Or if you want to create an original animation, for instance, on an IP, you're dealing with, um, you know, Netflix, you're dealing with Apple, you're dealing with Disney, um, and these are centralized entities. So we're still in this world of, of centralized distribution. Now there's teams like Feature who are working on decentralized distribution for content, but that solution's still a little bit on the horizon. Um, but so in the world, world today, if someone wants to develop a brand that starts on the blockchain and take it to that real into the real world and various applications, you're dealing with centralized entities. And so we're not quite there yet. And you need to build in that space and just operate that. We, have, we accept that we're operating with laws in the EU or in Asia or in the US that are different. Is an extension to that point, John, that is this an anti-CC0 argument, which is that these big brands and these big centralized entities are going to be hesitant to engage with a project or a brand that is in their mind a little bit free for all and could get associated with a fringe political party they don't want associated with their brand? I would say at a very general level, yes. Uh, now, a lot of people online are saying, well, Disney will never do CC0, partner with CC0. Don't underestimate a Disney's willingness to experiment. Um, but as a general rule, yes, there it, that will be a, a detriment to getting partnerships in place and deals done because Disney can't take the risk that their brand would be impacted if... Uh, let's say someone took a Moonbird and made toilet paper out of it or cannabis. Um, when we do licensing deals at Disney or in the past, when we did those deals, there were restricted categories. And it's a short list, but that was to protect the Disney brand. Firearms were restricted. Um, cannabis and alcohol were restricted. Um, certain food products were. Um, and under, un diapers and undergarments and, un with some limitations. Well, not only that, I mean, and you can speak to this, John, like Disney's been pretty litigious about anybody like a freaking preschool trying to use like a Mickey Mouse on the wall. They'll go after like they have they're very staunch about nobody gets to use our characters other than us. Yeah, I, I will say and the, the, I was at Lucasfilm before Disney and the same accusation was made around Star Wars. That's the public perception. And of course, they do some things to shoot themselves in the foot in that regard. The reality that no one ever saw, and I was the one who had to make these phone calls, is that more times than not, you get a friendly phone call from someone like me and not a lawyer. And I would say, hey, Sarah, I understand you're making mittens in your dorm room. It's cool. Just don't advertise in this location because now you're in trouble. But keep doing it. Sling it to your friends. It's okay. We're not going to care about that. So more times than not, you never see that aspect of it, but you're going to get a friendly phone call from someone who's not a lawyer. Just to But kind the of point being that's still you, you protecting yes. the IP. That's still saying, no, you can't just go out and advertise it anywhere and go anywhere with it. That's still Disney like taking steps to hyper control their characters and, and their, their things. DC, I want to throw it to you to, to maybe respond to some of the Moonbirds specific comments that Jimmy made. I think you, you had some thoughts you wanted to talk about in yeah, because I think the Moonbirds example is actually really interesting. And and first off, I, I don't want to. I personally don't want to dwell too much on um, should, is that the right move for Moonbirds or not? Because I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I think my default my default um, point of view is that um, I think that I can see that there's a value proposition for community tokens having being CC zero public domain. I can also see an argument, um, the side of the argument where it says, hey, it's better to you know, give people rights. But I think what is interesting is that they were able to do what they did. 
Okay. And I'm sure they consulted lawyers before they did it because what, in, and as far as I know, their license before to holders was you have commercial rights for your NFT. So not too different from what Yugo Labs has done for Board Apes and, and other, other companies have done for other assets. But then they basically said, Hey, you no longer have those rights. It's now public domain. What that reinforces for me is that the holders of the NFT actually did not have durable rights. That's what concerns me. It's kind of like, how are they able to do that? And how can, how will we know that won't happen in the future? And the other, uh, uh, take this example further, another thing that Moonbirds or any of these holders could have done is sold the IP rights to somebody else. They could have sold to Facebook and said, okay, now you've got it. And then Facebook could change those terms and conditions potentially. So I go back to, I'm not satisfied with how these representations are provided legally and I'm not, and especially if you're building like a multi-million dollar brand or whatever on top of these, my concern is that you're actually building on a shifting sand, more shifting than just knowing, hey, these are public domain CC0. Yeah, I can jump in and just add a couple of comments there. And I'd love to riff on John and Jim's point as well, because this is a super fascinating and very fun conversation so far. Uh, as it relates to the plethora of IP rights that we see in the space that are um, given to these communities, um, the truth is, is that if it's not CCO, if there is some, uh, if there, if, if these projects are on some part of the spectrum that is not giving full rights to the community to do whatever they would like or commercialize in any direction, what is often being given is a revocable license, which is why, you know, uh, the Larva Labs folks were able to sell CryptoPunks and MeBits to Yuga and why Yuga is able to modify the licensing rights that they're giving to these communities over time. And so without CCO, you're actually creating an environment across the space where everything that these community members think they have is actually based on a centralized third party, which is the, the true owner of that IP, giving them a revocable license to, to commercialize or to not commercialize in very specific targeted directions. So I would say once you've gone CCO, that, that genie can't be put back in the bottle. You can't rug your community and say, we're now changing in a different direction. But up until that point, Virtually every single project in the space that's IP has given their community members a revocable license that could be changed at any time. So, oh, so yeah, yeah go ahead, uh, go ahead, yeah, Jim. And then I want to get back some, to a different sure. point. There's some practicalities as to why that's the case. It's a great point. Um, it, it's a necessity at this time because of the way that copyright law is handled in the United States. You have to provide in writing transfer of copyright to anybody that you wish to, to put that to. And it's a more elegant approach to actually license it out. Um, and you can confer a license perhaps directly through the ownership of an NFT. Um, so that's one of the reasons that that's in place, as well as it gives the holder the right to enforce um, other things on behalf of the community that are copyright related. Um, and I believe you could probably write into the terms and irrevoc irrevocability of those things. Also, though, if it becomes later is through a course of all of this discussion and everything if it later is determined that you can perhaps transfer a copyright to an individual by transferring an nft and not have to license it then nft projects would have the option to have an irrevocable process as well here where they could not take back there's no take back sees once you've transferred that it is a written transfer of copyright. So that's one outcome we could potentially see through all of this as well that could actually make both CCO and copyright transfer very strong as far as blockchain technology is concerned. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. But no, I, no, no, no. Those I, are great I want to ask one follow-up question there for you, Jimmy, and then Derek, we'll, we'll go back to you, which is with CC0, and I, I was talking to some heavy hitter IP lawyers yesterday who confirmed this for me, right? You could... Uh, like Jimmy, you have kingship, you have, you have real projects you've done with your apes. And because you have businesses that you can show you're building around them, you could apply for a trademark. They could be CC0, you could still apply for a trademark from those apes. And this is like an identifier for your business. Is that not a more stable position to be in than one of these currently revocable licenses that you have, for example, with Yuga Labs? I don't think it would put me in any different position um, as far as like the context of that necessarily. Uh, I think my incentives would be different um, because other people could go out and do the same things with this ape. And also Universal's incentives would be different because similar to Disney, they have things that they don't want to represent and they want to make sure they protect their band's brand as well. So uh, it would be less likely 
that I would be able to make that deal in today's business landscape. Um, but it's possible, I guess, that there are still similar benefits um, if it was CCO, just not the same. And for me, it's less – so it's less clear to me what these amazing opportunities are that are like part of like the CCO is sliced bread narrative. Like I, I can see – potential and I really like what nouns is doing and maybe like someone here who's in nouns could give some really brief context. Cause we've mentioned it a couple of times and maybe there's people who are going to listening who haven't heard about nouns, but I do think a native community based like incentive, like where the IP is out in the open to begin with. And like there's assets creation and project creation. And that's where the true potential lies for CCO. I'm not sure that like it necessarily fits with traditional like PFP projects um, and with, um, you know, really with a lot of what the NFT projects that we see today, anyways, I probably said a lot in there, but no, that's great. And, and I think, again, we come back to that brand risk piece, which to me is a really big uh, piece to, to, if you want to uh, fight against CC zero is like, you couldn't have made a deal with universal at this point, if it was a CC zero project in all likelihood. Okay, Derek, we, we cut you off, finish your, the point you were originally making. No, Jim brought up some excellent points. I'm happy we double click there. The one thing I will just say super quickly before I, I talk about RevGen is this idea that you brought up Carly, which is CCO allows anybody the right to commercialize in any direction that they'd like. Um, what I think people fail to recognize and you brought up Carly is that those opportunities that you start to commercialize can actually enjoy the protection of the laws of the jurisdiction that you want them to. And so there's nothing saying that once you've created this base layer, this platform where anybody can take the IP and commercialize it in any direction under CCO, that the derivative work that you're commercializing can't be protected. It certainly can. And so whether it's kingship or whether it's another opportunity that people want to use with, with very specific Board Apes or if Board Apes was CCO or Moonbirds or Nouns or whatever it may be, those can actually avail themselves of the protections of copyright um, in any jurisdiction that they want to operate within. It's a very important point that I just want to like double click on before I move on to uh, like RevGen, which I think is like the bigger piece here. Well, not necessarily copyright, but trademark. That's exactly right? what I was going to say. Sorry, apologies. Trade, trademark. And I and I, I think another, as I play devil's advocate on, bo on both sides here, again, had a, a conversation with a number of IP lawyers yesterday, and where trademark gets tricky in this context of building a business with a moonbird, for example, is trademark is about not confusing the consumer. So if you have an identifier source that is your mark for your business, people aren't confused that there's six other businesses like yours that are using it. Moonbirds all look somewhat similar. So it's not necessarily clear that every individual Moonbird holder can trademark their individual bird for their businesses. Now you get complicated here because if you're building a totally different business than I'm building, we probably both can use a Moonbird. Like there's nuance upon nuance here, but I do think it's important to note that like in some ways you're actually competing for that trademark with your fellow Moonbird holders potentially, depending on what kind of business you're trying to operate in. There is a brand new staking feature in the Ledger Live app today. We all like staking the assets that we're bullish on, and now you can stake seven different coins inside the Ledger Live app. Cosmos, Polkadot, Tron, Algorand, Tezos, Solana, and of course, Ethereum. With Ledger Live, you can take money from your bank account, buy your most bullish crypto asset, and stake that asset to its network, all inside the Ledger Live app. Through a partnership with Figment, Ledger also lets you choose which validator you want to stake your assets with. And Ledger is running its own validating nodes, offering a convenient way to participate in network validation, and it even comes with slashing insurance. Ledger Live is truly becoming the battle station for the bankless world, so go download Ledger Ledger Live. If you have a ledger already, you probably already have it and get started securely staking your crypto assets. MetaMask is the leading Web3 wallet to get you access to everything you need in Web3. If you're just getting started on your NFT journey, you need MetaMask. And if you need to fund your MetaMask account in order to buy that NFT that you've been eyeing, well, now you can do that directly through MetaMask. Just click the blue buy button on the home screen. Personally, I'm mad that I've spent extra gas fees transferring money from Coinbase to MetaMask in order to buy NFTs. I've been using MetaMask directly and it is so much better. You can also buy stable coins and native tokens from Ethereum, Polygon, on Avalanche, CeeLo, and others. And you can do it directly with your debit card, your credit card, through Apple Pay or Google Pay. And there is now an improved buying experience on MetaMask Mobile. You'll only see tokens that are in your region, so it's personalized to you. And you'll get real-time quotes, so you know you're always getting the best deal. If you haven't downloaded MetaMask yet, what are you waiting for? Go try it out. You can learn more about buying cryptocurrencies with MetaMask at metamask.io slash buy-crypto.
Yep. I think these are all great points. Um, I think the, the time I want to spend more time and like, I'd love to hear from others as well, less on, um, like parsing through like the legalities of what you get or don't get with CCO, but why I actually think CCO is powerful and will create some big outcomes in the future. I think this is where the most interesting service areas. So I'll just say, I'll kick it off with like a few, uh, just general thoughts right now. Um, if I had to say like, are the biggest communities going to be the ones and it's certainly CCO will work for some non-CCO will work for others. Um, but if I had to say, like, if the goal is to optimize for being coming like this global brand where potentially millions of people can interact with the IP, build and commercialize in all sorts of different directions, can that, is that environment ripe for very tightly controlled IP? Or are there going to be, is that going to act as a mitigating factor, knowing what we know about the internet and how information flows very freely and attention being the scarce resource? Uh, is that going to stifle the type of innovation that we would see for a brand going from 6,800 Moonbird holders to potentially hundreds of millions of people building on top of this, this IP platform? And my view is that if you're not engineering your work, if that is the goal to be enjoyed by hundreds of millions of people and become a dominant global brand, if you're not engineering your work or your community or your product to be as networked as possible, knowing what we know about the flow of information on the internet, you're probably doing it wrong. And so what CCO does is it gives you a platform by which anyone can start to interact and commercialize and enjoy this technology, enjoy the IP that exists and leverage the technology of the internet and of Web3 uh, to start commercializing and bringing value back to that platform, much like people were able to do with Ethereum, which acts as this agnostic platform by which people can build on top of. And over time, there was Ethereum uh, was able to find ways to bring value back to the native asset of that economy, like Ether, um, by virtue of financial protocols being built on top, culture protocols being built on top, um, social protocols being built on top. And value flows back to this credibly neutral infrastructure that anybody can build on top without feeling like they're going to get rugged for their product, their asset, or their platform at any time. And I think that's only unlocked with the power of the internet, and that's only unlocked in marriage with the power of Web3, at least historically what we've seen. We, we keep Folks keep talking about uh... CC0 and all these questions around IP rights as tools. And I would love to get specific, which you're getting to here, Derek, about like, okay, if I'm a project founder, like what are the factors I should be thinking about to make me decide this should be CC0 versus this I should give IP rights? What are the, you know, what are the goals that would map to each of those? John, I would love to hear maybe your response to Derek. And I, I know you've you've shared with me things about, again, if you're trying to build a big media or entertainment brand and with TV shows and, and whatever else, like you probably shouldn't go CC zero these days. Um, maybe talk a little bit about that, John, and uh, in response to what Derek just said. Yeah, there's a couple points. The first is, yeah, absolutely, there is a power in having thousands of people building on a common platform and seeing where they take it. The challenge is that without a creative direction, and this is sort of kind of against the spirit of decentralization, but without some sort of creative visionary or to give the guidance of where that should go it can spin off in a lot of different directions and some of them might most of them will eventually ultimately be positive i think but some of them are going to be negative and there's going to be hiccups along the way the challenge comes back to that what's the distribution mechanism because these entities just aren't going to take that risk or make that investment to work with them and so you're almost having to build a second piece of the puzzle and that's another long-term sort of build. Now, ultimately, long term, I think that's going to be some amazing things are going to come from that. But short term, trying to build a business today, it's just going to be tough. You know, Disney, Disney has more brands collecting dust on the shelf than they can actually monetize and bring to market. And it's a challenge. You have these internal discussions of should we bring that brand back and in what form and or should we invest in something new? And they're not going to make those investments. They're not going to take those challenges unless they have the rights available to them to that they know that they can monetize. And if you know, if they were to say to go to nouns and say, hey, we want to develop content around nouns, but we can't monetize it because there's consumer products already being developed on nouns, that's going to be a disincentive to making that decision. You know, I, I'm going to hold up and for the folks listening just on audio and not seeing, so I'm holding up, this is some lapel pins that was created by uh, Big Shot Toy Works on the nouns. These are nouns glasses, the beautiful lapel pins. It's, I'm gonna wear this when I sit in front of the US Congress next year. And, um, you know, I love these. These are amazing. I'm actually gonna buy more of them. But, you know, and so it's nice that nouns that someone can go and this company can go and make these, but this isn't a big business. This is a nice side hustle, I'll call it. It's the beginning of a business. 
But if you want to go out and make a big brand today, you have to have those rights that you can start off with big businesses and, and partnerships. Well, and, and it's not even just about the partnership angle, which we've obviously touched on here. But John, I, when you were at Lucasfilm, like Star Wars had to battle to not get Star Wars on like toilet paper. Like you actually might want to <laughs> tightly control your brand for your own very valid reasons. I think Doodles is making this play. Like yeah. they don't want Doodles on cannabis and toilet paper because it actually does erode the core of what their brand is trying to be. Yeah, Star Wars toilet paper did happen. It was actually a project <laughs> I inherited. Um, it was an accident. It was part of a promotional partnership and someone didn't look at the fine details of the contract. And so we honored we honored the agreement and the partner was really a really good partner about handling it. But because they understood the sensitivities, but it did happen in the one. How does that time. end up in the fine? What's that fine print say that you <laughs> rushing to said. get rushing to get a deal done and someone didn't look at the fine print? But it said it, you can use it in toilet paper. It was a company called Ziwa out of um, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and they ha- they're they're like the Scott Paper Company of Europe, and uh, yeah. That happened. Fascinating. But anyhow, yeah, so that's why we have restricted categories. And I've advised projects in the space about adding restricted categories in their licenses. You know, I would love to see a CC0 license with restricted categories. I think that'd be really interesting. Um, just because it was cannabis, alcohol, firearms, and so on are going to be a problem for projects when those eventually happen. You know, it's interesting because I've seen board apes actually uh, be used in the cannabis industry already. So I wonder, you know, in the long term, how that will erode other brands, uh, you know, desire yeah, Moonbirds. to. Yeah. Moonbirds right. also did a cannabis They were project. CBD. Yeah. Is that, yeah. is that a guy? I think anything seeing? with commercial rights is probably safe to say is getting some sort of <laughs> cannabis deal at some point in time at this point. And, and that goes back to this, like yeah. what factors you could be, should you be considering? Like if you're really trying to be a family friendly brand because you're doodles or you're cool cats, it feels like this stuff clearly shouldn't be the route you go because there will inevitably be something like this. And if you're bored apes and you're like renegade and kind of like middle finger to the world anyway, this probably all just like helps your brand in, in, yeah, in a lot know, of ways. I would say like if you're bored apes, alcohol partnership, cannabis probably feels right. Diapers. I think people are going to get kind of pissed if they see board ape diapers. <laughs> I, I think the board ape community feels like anything goes. Zeneca Maybe DC, adult diapers will be okay. Yeah. Ape, it, uh, ape into your pants or something. Oh, my God. Oh God. This is, we're watching Jimmy's business mind at work. That's true. His next. Uh, ape in 24 7. Oh Fake God. diapers. You never have to leave your desk. Oh my God. Um, hey, if anybody's interested in doing that, quickly. hit me up. Hit yeah. me up. <laughs> He's on Twitter. Uh, DC, your your screen is a little out of focus, but I would love to to have you chime in here on like moments when you think this is appropriate or not. I think the art world is is clearly an exception here where we see less CC0 in the art world, X copy, obviously kind of changing that maybe. But DC, chime in on that. And then Zeneca, I want to get you in here too. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think, I think thinking about CC0 public domain for these community tokens versus art is an interesting um it's an interesting way to compare and contrast potential use cases. So I think just focusing on community tokens for a second, I think if you're trying to create an entertainment brand, then I think non CC zero probably makes more sense because you want to retain those rights. You're trying to use them in different ways. I get that. Um, I think if you're trying to create a memetic internet community um, that takes on a life of its own, then I think CC zero can make sense potentially. I mean, and we're still seeing how some of this plays out. I think the most interesting right now is, example right now is nouns. But when we think about it from the art perspective, I think if you're an artist, you really have to think about what you're trying to achieve as an artist. Um, and I've talked to a lot of artists about, hey, what do you think about CC zero? And they tell me the number one thing they tell me is they're afraid of their art being used for some kind of hate speech. And I do understand that. I'm not sure all of that fear is like 100% rational because they're looking at a couple of extreme examples where things have been used negatively. But I think most use of a public domain assets is not for hate speech. I mean, that's just reality. There's a small minority, but yeah, your work could end up as that. Okay. Um, but I think also some want to retain control of their IP because they want to be able to benefit from it later. And I understand that too. Like you create something, maybe you want to create as a brand, maybe you want to create, you want to get your artwork on coach wallets and you want to make money from that one day. I mean, look, uh, there's a hundred different, a thousand different ways to do art and to have your rights and your work represented in different ways. But I think also, um, what if you have the basis for a really great meme or mimetic asset, and it never becomes valuable because you've controlled how far it can spread effectively. And I think that's what CC0 is going to challenge. So I think that when I think about um, 
X copy is the most prominent example recently. He made a lot of his previous works, C or all of his previous works, CC0 public domain. I think the long-term relevance of that is going to be very interesting to watch because if that adds value back to X copies NFTs and he's earning royalty income from that, then I think we can view that potentially as a success. Okay. And if, and if people are making money off of his work by printing t-shirts and creating X copy wallets and coach wants to create an X copy wallet and he doesn't get paid from that, that might be okay. Because here's the thing, X copy, because of the nature of his work, he's probably not going to engage in partnerships like that himself. It's going to come across as un unauthentic. It's going to come across as kind of weird. And a lot of times this stuff happens, it happens the estate is taking the work of an artist who has passed away and is putting it on bags and wallets and lunch boxes and stuff like that. So I think that, and, and so, so I think that a lot of artists are not naturally going to partnership partner with corporations. But anyway, if people start taking X copies work and basically spread the meme and his art style across the entire world, it's hard to, for me to imagine that his NFTs are not going to become more valuable. It's hard for me to imagine that he's not going to become a more famous artist, uh, maybe one of the most famous living artists as a result of that. So anyway, like I said, this is all an experiment in flight and progress, but those are some of the things I'm watching. Seneca, you purchase a lot of CC0 projects. How will we know if CC0, the CC0 experiment succeeds? What are you looking for to be able to say, yes, this achieved what I thought it would? I think we won't know for many, many years, but it will be able to look back and see the, again, the proliferation of these the memes, uh, at the end of the day, it all comes down to memes. And uh, if you understand memes <laughs> and the mimetic nature of how culture spreads throughout society and the internet, I think, yeah, it, real alpha is, is looking to memes. That's what these things are at the end of the day. And, you know, in five years from now, and if we see that Moonbirds is this massive, I'm using Moonbirds because of the recent decision, this massive global brand that a lot of people have built on top of, I would say that it's probably a success. And, and could that have happened while it was, under the previous commercial license, maybe, probably. Like it, the, the reality is it's very difficult to compare and contrast and say, you know, we can't look at two timelines where Moonbirds was CC0 and, and wasn't. We can look at Moonbirds versus something like Bored Apes or Doodles or Cool Cats and compare and see how those play out. Uh, but in terms of success, it, it's just gonna be really difficult to tell without looking at just basic metrics a few years from now. Is the price of your bags one of those metrics? It probably is like if these underlying that's you know at, at the end of the day if the if cco is to succeed i think one of the most important metrics will be whether the original assets are deemed valuable in the future you know because because the, the, the we're taking the value out of the ip and hoping that it, it accrues to the underlying assets uh i want to talk about uh in a slightly different direction blitmap because they went CC0 in August last year. This is a project by Dom Hoffman. And they launched and they weren't CC0 and then they put it to a community vote and overwhelmingly the support was there and then they released the IP in the public domain. And one of the examples given in like the blog post about it was imagine if you could own Excalibur's sword. Would that not have value today if you could prove? Collectors, I think, would value that and there'd be some sort of value, whether it's more or less than owning the IP and, and, and again, to, I think it was DC's point earlier, at the end of the day, all of everything is going CC0 anyway, uh, after a certain amount of time. So this um, is, this gets to an important question to me, which is like timing of CC0. I, I forget who said it earlier, but the idea, I think it was you, you, Roy, who said like, maybe after five years it goes CC0, because it's this incentive piece that Jimmy is pointing out, which is that, I mean, look, I don't know the exact story, uh, history of whatever, Sir Lancelot and, and that story getting written, but it seems like, the getting to own this piece of work, like the incentive to create creative work is tied with ownership. And then sure, down the line, it's super valuable and somebody wants Excalibur sword, but are you gonna get these Sir Lancelot stories? Can you get the next Shakespeare if it starts wanna, as CC0? Is the incentive there? Yeah, so, so a, topic, a point that came up before is that if something CC0, you know, you don't have this centralized entity building out the IP and controlling the narrative. And I'm not convinced that they're mutually exclusive. And again, using the, the Blitmap example, the team there, they're building out the world, the law, they've got the Blitverse, they've got uh, rivals, I think they're called. They're, they're working and spending significant money on building out this entire ecosystem and IP, even though they don't own the IP for it. 
and the community also has the freedom to go off and do whatever they want. And, and we've seen instances of people taking uh, Blitmap assets or, or incorporating them into other projects. The, the Blitmap logo is probably like the, the now the red and blue Foursquare logo. You know, we've seen that in um, Chain Runners, and we've seen that in other CCO projects. And we, I, I, it's sort of like proliferating, where the community is like, "All right, cool, we can use this stuff. Let's go and expand it." But the team is still working and building out this like centralized narrative. So, it, of course, there's some friction where if someone goes off and creates toilet paper and, and diapers, then it doesn't quite make sense and be cohesive. But the, the team is still going, all right, so this is what, like we have a narrative, we're gonna create it, and then the community can riff off of that. And the wider community, anyone in the space, like this, again, this open source narrative, anyone can come and build on top of it and, and just let's see what happens. Whereas, you know, there is a narrative, but it's also CC0. Could Star Wars have been created, John, I know you wanna get in here, so I'm gonna direct this question to you and then you can say what you want. Could Star Wars have been created if in parallel to George Lucas creating it, a community was running wild with the, the same characters? No chance. Never would have happened. Um, he, you know, I, I think for a lot of franchise type IP, you need some sort of a creative visionary. And that's what, what, are, what you're buying into. Um, now, there certainly are projects in development right now that are more community driven storytelling. And I think there'll be some interesting projects to come out of that. And the, the jury's still out on how those are going to perform. But we buying into the vision of a creative person, a George Lucas, a Steven Spielberg. And I think that's great that we want to do that. I want to hear a voice and hear a story from a voice. And over time, some of those voices become a brand. Like George Lucas has a style. Steven Spielberg has a style. And that's a brand that I want to see and pay money to, to experience. Um, but I'm going to go back real quick on the CC0, what Roy was saying. And about the, the kind of this experiment that it's still too soon. I actually think we are seeing success in CC0. It's just not the place yet where big businesses are going to be built. But the signs I'm seeing, and this is why I'm experimenting and working in the space, is that it looks good. It looks like this could turn into something. It's just not going to be this year. And I need to build a business this year. But it's worth my time and attention because it's going to be big eventually. Yeah, I'd love to I'd jump in and respond to, to Roy and John. Uh, first, I'll just say um, that is not without drawbacks, this idea of like the centralized creative decision maker. Um, episodes four, five, and six, the original Star Wars were amazing. Episodes one, two, and three, not as good. Um, and so I would argue that there is, uh, don't mean to st stab you, John. I, I'm, ju I'm, just merely my... articula I'm just merely articulating that it, I wish it was as black and white as this, but it, it, it isn't. Um, I would say more importantly, uh, just some of the things that Roy, Roy were talking about. I, I, um, I actually very strongly believe that, um, I, you know, if I were to reduce down like the, the optimal organization to really make CCO work, it probably comes down to three things. It's open permissive rights that allow people to build on top. It's some revenue engine that exists to, to incentivize through the community, others who are not owners of those objects to build on top. So it doesn't have to be you know, an object-based incentive, like they don't have to own the object, the underlying object to build on top, but there's some other incentive that exists, maybe through um, dollars or ETH or some other incentive that can exist by which to build on top of that. And then third, to the point about optimizing for those first two buckets, some centralized decision maker that's running in parallel with those first two buckets that brings persistent value back to the project over and over and over again over the course of many decades. Now, I think if you could have those three buckets and fine tune the parameters, my view is that it will lead to some very interesting results that if you're not structurally set up to do, will, like will, your project can get handicapped in ways that are unintentional if you're not really leaning into the principles of Web3 and information flow and this ability for us to just send value and information at the speed of light on these trust minimized ledgers. And I think if you can figure out how to weight each of those three buckets optimally, I think we'll find that some massive, massive outcomes will get created here. The last thing I'll say is just um, is just around this idea of uh, of incentives and um, where we're at currently in the cycle. I really do think incentives really are the the key here, and I do think that there is ways to turn these knobs to create incentives for a global audience to interact with CCOIP. And it's just a matter. Of, it, this to me is an optimization question, less than it is like, will this happen or not? And I think it will definitely happen. And I think the best organizations are going to figure out a way to open up the IP, 
create uh if the goal is to mon is to monetize in ways that aren't conducive to like what you you've been describing john which is like a you know a web 2 you know media brand um open up the ip allow people to build on top of it incentivize them to do so regardless of if you're a holder and have some centralized decision maker that's taking the input of the community to add fuel to the fire that's getting created in these first two buckets but i'll pause here DC, I want to let you say something about composability. Jimmy would love to let you ha have a closing word here if you have anything you want to say. And then I might round it out with my takeaway from this conversation. Yeah, th thanks, Carly. And I think, you know, my first point on this is if you look at some of these metaverse apps that are evolving, um, I think we're going to hit some interesting flashpoints on how certain IP can be used in those metaverses. And when I say metaverses, I mean like other side, I mean the Ohm open metaverse that Punk6529 um, is pushing out there. And it was interesting to me actually in the Yuga announcement when they showed toads and nouns and they showed them alongside in that little spaceship with the others. And part of, I have to think part of that reason was because they could just use that IP for free without asking anybody. And I think that's a pretty powerful value proposition when you think about that. Um, I think just another point that I wanted to offer up was when we think about these centralized coordinated communities where a centralized actor is pushing it forward, I definitely see the value proposition of that. And I can see why some people are really interested in participating in those communities. But one of the things that CC0 allows participants of those communities to do, if your IP custodian sucks, um, or if your IP rights holder sucks, if they become someone evil that you don't like, you actually have the opportunity to liberate your community from them to some extent. Now that now you're not going to have access to the community treasury or the royalties, but you can take the idea if your community agrees that, hey, this idea is bigger than the custodian, you have an opportunity to fork it or do other interesting things potentially that you might not be able to do with owned IP rights. So we haven't seen like a lot of flashpoints where that would be like super interesting yet. But if these community tokens continue to be important over the next five to 10 years, we're definitely going to see some situations where this comes into play. I think that's interesting on the community side. I, I was going to say one, one piece where I feel like both sides of these arguments uh, maybe go wrong is I think uh, folks who are on the, the super strong IP right side maybe overestimate how often people will really be able to get licensing deals for their their you know NFTs. Jimmy, I think you're sort of an exception to this. So you want to jump in? Well, yeah, I mean, I do have a comment there. Uh, a, a recent deal I did with a content licensing company is they're taking all of my commercial IP NFTs and they're content tagging them on YouTube. So anytime it's used in any sort of video where there's monetization involved, I will get an appropriate cut of that. And uh, YouTube's uh, CEO, I believe, recently came on and talk, discussed how um, content ID and content tagging that YouTube has actually built perfectly for this and being able to prove like the original origination of that content at least on their platform and then appropriately um giving rights to the uh, content uh, creators for that and so i've started to apply that um, for my nfts as well and and it's not to say that i expect any significant income from any of that at all but you could register you there could be a mechanism where you could easily like web3 connect your wallet to youtube for example uh, it would go through, scan the appropriate on-chain mechanisms that said you had IP rights to these things and then could basically give you a revenue stream, however small or large that might be, without much effort or uh, the necessity of a network or anything in place to make these deals. So That's interesting. You know. And I know there's I know there's people working on products like like a Shutterstock, Shutterfly, on-chain equivalent. So like any time if it was used in a news story, for example, it could automatically have a license in place so you can make money. Okay, that's interesting. I, that being not that notwithstanding, you made the point like sure it, revenue your, your on this point is, is probably not lost small. on me. That yes, right yes. now you need relationships, you need something desirable, and more, it seems more people uh, don't have the as desirable assets or the wherewithal where with the ability to go out and make these deals themselves. Um, that is a tougher uh, hill to climb at the moment. Um, so it makes IP rights maybe less important to most collectors. The flip side of this is I was going to say, I think similarly, the CC0 community overestimates how much people are going to go off and do like amazing things with the IP now that it's CC0 and that the next Beethoven's coming along to make his masterpiece with blip maps or like whatever the case may be. So, you know, we're talking about probably niche scenarios <laughs> in both cases um, and, and something to, to consider if you're launching a project. Okay, John, you have some really interesting 
insight, I think, to share around things that are happening on the uh, the Senate side. The, the Senate is investigating things around IP and NFTs, and you've been involved in that. So, would love to have you share that with folks. Yeah, I just say as we're wrapping up, um, you know, it's an, this is a very important topic that, regardless of where you sit on the spectrum and what your feelings are, and some things are going to start changing in the next year or so. And what that's whether it's coming from is the United States Senate. So about a month ago or earlier this summer, the U.S. Senate asked the U.S. Copyright and Trademarks offices to work together and conduct a study over the next year about how NFTs and Web3 are going to impact intellectual property rights. The work of that study is going to impact the legislation coming out of the U.S. Congress for years to come. This will impact the space that we're all working in or folks who aren't working but still love the space for, for years. It's incredibly important that we get our voices heard and participate in this study. So they're about to kick this off maybe another month or two. And when that happens, there'll be periods along the way for public comments where you can submit. They do take those public comments seriously. And so I want to finish with is saying, we'll make sure whatever best I can, I'm sure Carly will too, yeah. to communicate, hey, there's an opportunity for public comment Regardless of how you feel, make sure you're heard. Because if you're not heard, a bunch of people in Washington who no, don't even know what an NFT is are going to start writing laws that affect you. Yep. And so we need to make sure that we're, that we're participating in that. And I did have an opportunity to pre-brief the committee about a month ago as they were kicking this off. And I do know that they are really focused on consumer protection. They're feeling that consumers buying NFTs are not fully informed as to what they're buying. They're obviously worried about the rug pulls and the scams, as we all are, but they're also worried about licensing. So this topic is directly relevant to what the Senate's gonna be working on. So please participate, get engaged, and um, let's be heard. Love it. Okay, I was gonna close this out, and then any, if somebody has one final thought, Actually, they can chime I, in too. I wanna say w w one quick thing. Um, Hit us, Roy. I, first of all, John, I think that's amazing that you're, you know, you're, you're talking with them, and absolutely we should all get behind you know, mm -hmm. have our voices heard. And I think that's a, mm -hmm. a really important thing. And in terms of like protecting the public, I, one of the dangers for CC0 that I've sort of seen and, and been thinking about is as it becomes like this narrative, everyone's talking about it, there's like buzz around it and hype around it. I think because it's still so widely misunderstood, there's a real danger where artists, creators, project founders, they might rush into a decision, de decision and make their IP or their creations CC0 without fully understanding it's irreversible, it's permanent and the full ramifications. And I think that, uh, you know, just because you see some, some tweet from, you know, any, any of us up here or you see a decision from Moonbirds going CC0, that does not mean your project should be CC0. And I think that you know, it, it's the thing that we've all mentioned 10 times is this chat. It's like CC0 and different IP rights are a toolkit, um, are tools in a toolkit. And, and you know, really think hard about what you're going to do, especially if you want to go CC0, because it is permanent. Yeah, I just want to end with that's that. A, that's a great point. And, and essentially what I was going to do is, is just kind of summarize, I think, wh where we've landed with some of this. And, and maybe we can all like have a little like, yes, we sign off. This is what we think is true. Um, which is, if you are somebody who is creating art, whether that be like individual art or you're trying to build, you want a TV show with Netflix, you want to build the next Marvel series, you are not the candidate to rush into CC0. Uh, you know, you are probably somebody who wants to be uh, much more restrictive about it, a little bit more centrally controlled, building your vision. If you're trying to partner with big brands for what you want to do, if you want your art, if you want to make a licensing deal yourself with with a uh, coach down the line so that your artwork can feature on one of their T-shirts, CC0 is probably not for you, certainly at this stage. If, however, your art feels like it's around community building and the play you're trying to make is to just proliferate your symbol so that you have a cultural cachet so that a lot of people see it and think like, oh, that's interesting. What is that? I want to be a part of that group. I want to be in that in crowd, whatever it might be, because it's something funny or it's kind of satirical. That might be a really awesome time to use CC0 because that proliferation could come out of it. Goblin Town is I think, a perfect example of that. That feels to me like a really resonant time to use CC0 because it's just, it's so mimetic to use the word that DC Investor has, has taught me. Um, so that would be my summary of this. How do people feel about that as a, as a general overview? 
I say it's great, but I I always put an asterisk because it's like okay. it, there's always an it depends with each scenario. Sure. And sure. Yeah, but I I definitely agree. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you all so much for this. See, not too not too fiery, not too uh, nothing too crazy. Everyone kept it pretty civil, and uh, I will. I'm sure I'll see all of you again at some point individually on this show. I would hope and and otherwise. Thanks for joining. <laughs> So much for watching this episode of Overpriced JPEGs. If you liked this conversation, if you liked this episode, please go ahead and hit subscribe. It helps me out, it helps the show out, and it means you will get alerts and updates when we post new content. Thanks again.